Hi, Misha here, and since I've been covering the MiGs, we just got through with the 21, let's talk about the MiG-25 Foxbat again. And yeah, I've already done a couple of videos on this, so if I bore you, yeah, you can leave. <laughs> and if you decide to stay, I'll try to make it a, at least a little entertaining, but I just, you know, why not? Because it is an impressive aircraft, even to this day. But it was not without its shortcomings, even back in the 1960s. As you well know, it basically inspired the F-15, amongst others. And it's one of the few aircraft that Iraq actually successfully operated during the Gulf War. Actually downing a F-18 Hornet. And it's been used by quite a few other Warsaw and friendly militaries for half a century. But production numbers were actually quite low, at least compared to the other MiGs. You know, the, the MiG-15, the MiG-21 were into the tens of thousands, well into five digits. With the MiG-25, they produced just under 12 and it had a very specific dedicated role or at least two of them and it, they tried to do other things with it but really it was an interceptor or if you like a strategic fighter and it is also well suited to become a reconnaissance aircraft as well as an anti-reconnaissance aircraft so with that we'll dive in now this 172 scale model here from Hobby Master is of the Iraqi one. This is a MiG 25 PDS, not public display of affection or something, but we'll talk about what that means. But it, it is in the kind of true interceptor role with four R 40 missiles on it. It has two 40 T's and two 40 R's or 40 P's which are heat seekers and radar guided. No cannon. Well after World War II in Soviet Russia the PVO was charged with defending Russian airspace. The VVS was more of a tactical air force and in the 1950s, of course, they worked on the MiG-15, MiG-17, MiG-19, MiG-21. And so the MiG Design Bureau was kind of thinking about an interceptor. The other aircraft were pretty small. Yeah, the MiG-21, they did try and succeeded to make it into an interceptor with the uh, PF, PFM series. But they wanted to make something more high performance. And in 1958, specifications came down from the Soviet high authority. <laughs> they wanted something capable of really getting up to 90,000 feet or close to it and getting over 1,800 miles per hour, capable of carrying long range guided missiles. Just a very high performance craft. And in 1959, MiG got serious and started working on, well, they, they had a few different design concepts. They would, pretty much knew they wanted to use a two-engine design, or had to, but they didn't know how to do it. They considered mounting the engines in the wings. They considered mounting them vertically, like on the English Electric Lightning. But in the end, they kind of went with this traditional styling here. Probably not a bad choice. They also looked at making it out of titanium, but instead they mostly used stainless steel, about 80% of the airframe, and the rest would be aluminum alloy and titanium. There was a lot of temperature things we could get into it, but essentially the design was hit upon and approved to make a prototype in 1962, and they would do four prototypes, two in a reconnaissance version, and two is a interceptor. See, originally, Russia wanted 
this aircraft to counter bomber threats like the B-58 and the canceled B-70. But by the 1960s, the U.S. was really kind of getting away from that. And Sam, well, surface-to-air missiles were getting to the point they could be used. But then we had Gary Powers in the U-2 affair, and Russia became more concerned and annoyed by overflights. The U-2 was one thing, but then, of course, the SR-71 would become a supersonic threat. They also thought, well, maybe an aircraft with high altitude, high speed performance could itself be a reconnaissance. So that's why they ended up doing kind of two parallel versions. The Interceptor for the PVO and the Reconnaissance for the VVS. And in March of 1964, the first reconnaissance prototype flew, and then in that September, the first interceptor prototype flew. And the major difference was, of course, the interceptor had guided missiles, and the reconnaissance version had a nose with uh, about five cameras in it, amongst other changes. And there were other little differences, too. So they would continue to work on the design. They would eventually build four pre-production reconnaissance and nine pre-production interceptors. This did include, like, static test models and training models that would never leave the ground, so they weren't all flying models, though. And they would first kind of be shown to the world in July of 1967, but really the aircraft was still not ready. It had a lot of going on to it. Finally, it was approved for full production in 1969, and the first version to go into service, the MiG-25R, as it was known, went into the VVS service in 1969, and deliveries really started in 1970, and the MiG-25P would be approved for PVO service in 1971, and start to come in in 1972, give or take. Now, interesting thing about the name MiG-25, at one time MiG-23 was assigned to the swept wing competitor to the MiG-21. As we know, of course, the Delta Wing MiG-21 won out. So the 25 name, uh, excuse me, the 23 name was in limbo for a while. Of course, it would eventually be used on kind of the companion aircraft to this, at least in some sense. We'll talk about that next time. And I'm sure you already know. I have faith in your intelligence. Famous last words. So yeah, these were in service in the uh, early 70s. And what exactly do we have here? Designated as Fox Bat A, the original MiG-29P really was a dedicated high-performance interceptor. It had four long-range air-to-air missiles. In fact, these R-40s are about the largest air-to-air missiles out there. It originally had a very powerful Smirch A-1 radar set. It wasn't look-down, shoot-down, or even look-down capable. It was just really, really powerful. And it had a range of up to over 60 miles for detection and over 30 miles for tracking, which, as you can tell, is a vast improvement over the uh, the MiG-21 PFM. No cannon. They did consider having a be a two-seater, but they went with a single seat, relying on uh, assistance and control from the ground to help the pilot navigate in towards this target. And it could carry four heat seekers or four semi-active radar guided, but typically they would carry two and two. This model is set up that way, you can tell. Uh, two missiles have kind of a larger rounded tip and two of them have a slimmer um, kind of pointy tip. And we had, of course, the two engines. This thing burned hot and heavy and uh, <laughs> really scared the West when it was first uh, shown off. And the first ones to really go into combat zone were actually the 25Rs. They were sent to Egypt in 1971 and did flyovers of Israel and quickly showed that Israeli aircraft could not catch up with them. 
They would go back home the following year, but then they would go back in 1973 and be there for the Yom Kippur War at the end of that year. And by this point, the P version was starting to come into service in Russia. And of course, it would spread out amongst the nations. But in 1976, the most famous event with this took place when Viktor Blenko defected to Japan, not just with his MiG-25P, but with quite a bit of technical documentation and manuals and everything he could. And this allowed the West to really get a look at it and realize that the radar, while very powerful, was actually pretty old-school primitive tech, as it's quite famously known, it used vacuum tubes. And they noticed that it didn't have look-down, shoot-down capability, amongst other limitations. They also realized that the MiG-25, while very fast and high-flying, in fact, it would ultimately set 29 records, it, um, it wasn't that maneuverable. And while the original version was uh, pretty much filled with fuel, <laughs> about 70% of its internal volume was fuel tankage, including the wings. It still had somewhat limited range and endurance, at least without uh, an external tank, which the first versions, I don't believe they commonly mounted or even maybe could mount. This went through a lot of evolution, though. So the Soviet Union protested and demanded their property back, and it was returned but they should have specified how many pieces they wanted it back in. Obviously, with Japanese assistance, the Americans really took it apart and got as good of a look as they could before sending it back in multiple crates. But that's actually kind of what led to the PD version, the interceptor upgrade version. This would go from the original Smirsh radar, which would be the A3, towards the end of initial production over to an upgraded sapphire radar which was actually taken from the MiG-23 flogger or at least developed from its radar and this would really catapult the MiG-25 into something quite effective dangerous and actually would make it into a halfway decent fighter not just bomber interceptor and, of course, both of these models here have that upgrade. In November of 1976, the Soviet government ordered an improved version, which would enter into production as the MiG-25 PD, D being upgraded or updated. And it would soon enter into service, and older aircraft would be retrofitted with the new equipment, becoming the MiG-25 PDS, with it meaning interceptor updated field modification. So really they became the same. Externally, the only real noticeable difference between the P and PDs, the um, PD and PDS needed a slightly extended, longer nose cone to house the new Sapphire Pulse Doppler Radar. This radar allowed for improved range, but mainly it was there for true look-down, shoot-down capability. It could also interact with the new missiles. There were new versions of the R-40, the uh, RD, and TD. Plus now the outer hardpoints could mount a double pylon to carry the new lightweight short-range R-60 missile. They could carry up to four of these plus two of the larger R-40s on the inboard pylons. And yeah, so the little ones would be for self-defense or air-to-air -air combat with the larger ones more for offensive things going at bombers or something else large. This version never really had any ground attack capability. They also made this giant fuel tank standard. Again, the uh, Foxbat did have a lot of internal fuel, 
but this is one of the largest external tanks on any military aircraft, giving it more for its engines. And speaking of, they also took the opportunity to improve and update the engines. The original ones did have some issues. While on paper they could achieve Mach 2.8, even maybe greater, in reality the original R25s would overheat and burn out. Well, with the improved version, the maximum speed was, at least the maximum safe speed was increased, although it still couldn't maintain it for a huge amount of time. Cruise speed was more like Mach 2.3, 2.4, you know, only. <laughs> but maximum speed was at least 2.8 with the new version, and some sources put it at over Mach 3, at least for short durations. Maximum altitude without a payload. Some of the records set were over 100,000 feet, even over 115,000. And that was more of a specialized version. More of the military version, maximum altitude without payload was a little under 90,000 feet. With two missiles, a little under 80,000 feet. And fully loaded up, a little under 70,000 feet. So plenty high. Of course, this is a large aircraft. It's about 65 feet long with about a 46 foot wingspan and again one crew member of course it had an improved KM1M ejection seat and everything was meant for the high temperatures and high stresses of its high performance but thanks to the R excuse me the PD update it could be used in something more like a fighter role but the reconnaissance version would continue on too. And I really wish that Hobbymaster would consider doing a 25R. I think that'd be neat. Now in Russia, they were considering doing kind of a next generation. By the way, the uh, PD was known as the Fox Bat E. And they were considering doing the uh, MiG 25M and they were testing it, but this ultimately would evolve into the MiG 31 Foxhound, which is something Hobbymaster definitely should do a model of. That said, we sh I guess should just be grateful that someone's doing a 172 scale diecast MiG-25 and doing it quite well. This is a very metal model. It's a very heavy model too. I think that's why they don't have the style where you can put the tank on. I think that'd be maybe a little too much stress on it. But uh, yeah, it's chunkers. And it has the usual Hobby Master feature, including gear up or down. And can it be open closed? And they do come with a few different missile load loadouts. They have both R40s, and they this one has the R60s. Like I said, though, this one's from the Libyan Air Force. They started to acquire these in the late 70s. They got both the R version and the PD getting I think 96 in total and they would be operating these in 1981 during the Gulf of Sidra affair and um, they would actually still be in service in 2011 but they were grounded so they survived and some of them were actually refurbished and retrofit and put back into service just a few years ago in 2015 and that's kind of the benefit of this even though it uses kind of old school tech it was chunky, strong, designed to operate in the cold, designed to be maintained then by less than knowledgeable crew on the ground. So you know, in the good, it's all stainless steel. It's just it's a it's a durable design, at least compared to other high performance aircraft in its class, like say the SR seventy one Blackbird. And so it really has served for quite a while. It was also in the Syrian Air Force. Uh, Syrian MiG-25s would engage Egyptian examples, excuse me, <laughs> Israeli examples throughout the 1980s. And some would still be flying in 2014 when all the kerfuffle kind of heated up in that region of the world too. And there are still some of these flying, although not really in Russia. And um, yeah, it proved to be quite a good little airplane all things considered and it was 
less expensive than you might think to manufacture, at least compared to its contemporaries and considering its very um, high performance. Its original bomber interceptor role was kind of alleviated thanks to satellites and everything. The reconnaissance role still remained important, but it ended up kind of just being a fighter interceptor more than a bomber interceptor throughout the 1980s. And there were many variants made. For example, one cool one was the MiG-25BM Foxbat F. This was a seed roll aircraft, suppression of enemy air defenses. One of really just a few that the Soviet Union ever did. They never really got into dedicated seed roll. But unlike American seed roll planes that were kind of mud fighters that would get down in the dirt, and it was more of a high altitude aircraft with standoff missiles. So a different approach to the, the concept there. But they would only build about a hundred of them. But they would see some service. There was also the MiG-25RB reconnaissance bomber version where they would first strap four and then as many as ten bombs under this to drop. It was sort of successful. <laughs> and there was the mig 25 uh, PU series, which was a two-seat trainer, also known as Fox Bat C. And that would be another neat one for uh, Hobby Master to do, because the way MIG installed the second cockpit was uh, quite unique. So lots of little versions, but with a production number under 1,200, that kind of tells you a lot of them weren't made in significant numbers. But because of their durability, they did serve for quite a while wanted to bring the PDS back out again to talk about Iraqi service. You know, in the 1980s, Iran flew the F-14, the Tomcat. That was kind of their premier fighter. Well, for Iraq, they flew the MiG-25. That was their premier fighter, and they did well with it. It shot down at least a dozen enemy aircraft, enemy, enemy fighters, and Iraq only lost three MiG-25s during that war. And at least one of them was actually due to ground fire. Two might, may have been. So not a bad ratio at all, all things considered. And in the 1999, excuse me, 1991 Gulf War, it had a pretty good record too. These was, would engage the F-15. The aircraft kind of created to combat it, or at least in fear of it. Now two MiG-25s would be shot down by uh, allied F-15s, but the rest would be able to use their speed and just run away. And up against the F-A-18s, like I said, this model here is patterned after the one that actually shot down an F-A-18, really the only air-to-air -air victory fighter on fighter as such during the 91 Gulf War. So compared to the, how the rest of the Iraqi Air Force did, the Fox Bat came out pretty good. And they would continue in Iraq throughout the 1990s. And kind of the last major action would be in 2002 when an Iraqi uh, PD would shoot down uh, a drone right before the invasion, which was in March of 2003. But in that war, they would be grounded and uh, not, not deployed. So didn't really play a significant role there. But yeah. The Iraqi MiG-25 has something to say for it. That's really why I picked up this model. Plus, it did start off life as a P. Oddly, though, the only MiG-25P that Hobby Master has done, they've done seven in this series of models. They've only done one P, and that was issue one, and that was uh, Belenko's, as you would imagine. But all the rest have been PDs or PDSs. And I really hope they do something else, a, a BM or an RB or just an R. There's a lot of possibilities. Or, you know, if they really feel adventurous, I, I will take a Foxhound. Well, which one would you like to see? That's kind of an interesting question. If Hobby Master were to do a, a, another variant, which one in the series would you like? And with that, let's wrap things up. Well, I appreciate you hanging out with me. I know I've already covered this aircraft a couple of times. Hopefully this time I got something better on camera for you. You know I do the best I can. 
but since I am covering the other MIGs, it just seemed wrong not to talk about the Fox Bat again. Plus, it really is cool. And one thing that seems strikes me with this aircraft, it reminds me almost of a Sukhoi. You know, the, the twin engines, the large designs, usually your MIGs are, are pretty small, single engine. And sometimes twin, but even then they tend to be small, tactical aircraft. This is one of the few truly big MIGs, and this is kind of the last successful one, because after that, after the 25 here, the uh, Sukhoi company would kind of take over this long-range tactical fighter interceptor role with their quite successful SU-27. They'd already had good success with the SU-24 and the SU-25, but those were strike aircraft. With the SU-27, they had a true fighter on their hands, and that kind of left MiG doing its thing with the MiG-23, which we'll get to next, and the MiG-29, which, I mean, yeah, how can you not like the 29? And on top of just being a cool aircraft, the 25 here, Hobby Master did a really um, bang-up job. This is, like I said, the all-metal. Um, the top is plastic, metal, all metal till you get to the very nose. Yeah, it's uh, it even comes with a metal stand. So yeah, pretty neat aircraft. And if they ever do any more variants, I will, I will definitely pick more up. So yeah, feel free to let me know what you think. And if you'd like Hobby Master to do a Foxhound or one of their variants, uh, give William over there a shout and let him know that's what you'd like to see. They did just get a new factory. They have more capabilities now. So, cross fingers, I guess anything's possible. They're doing an SU-30, and they're doing the SU-57, so they are expanding their range. And they did announce a new MiG-25 for next year, but it is just another PD, unfortunately. So, we'll see. Appreciate you hanging out with me. As always, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.